This is Powering the Future, a podcast series brought to you by Smart Grid Forums. One planet, one power grid. Hello. In this episode, we're tackling one of the biggest challenges facing the energy sector today, building and retaining a skilled workforce for the grid of the future. From long-term project fatigue to fierce job market competition, what's driving young engineers away and how can we keep them engaged? To discuss this with me is Ronan McEwen, Future Networks Director at Northern Ireland Electricity Networks. Hi, Ronan. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Thanks for having me along, Mandana. So, Ronan, it was wonderful to have you at um, SGT25 in The Hague recently, where you talked about workforce um, challenges and solutions for the power grid. Um, there's a lot going on at NIE, as I understand it, lots of culture change, lots of initiatives to engage talent. Tell us a little bit about the, the challenges that you've been facing in recent years in terms of attracting and retaining good engineering ta- talent to the grid. Okay, yeah, I think like, like most uh, network companies that are uh, facing the same challenges as, our, as ourselves, um, the kind of things that we've been looking into over the last number of years is a significant amount of growth and activity. Mm-hmm. So as we deal with the, the challenges that the grid presents, there's obviously a lot of investment needed um, to kind of get it ready for the future. And with that, you need to be bringing in people that, and skills into the organization to be able to deliver that. So over the last number of years, um, particularly in the kind of the connection side of the business, I would have noticed, you know, we're seeing more and more different types of technology trying to connect onto the grid and just the, the actual volumes uh, coming through increasing. And that's put a lot of pressure on our organization just to be able to keep up with that pace and bring people in and train them at the, at the, at the rate needed. So when, whenever we would have first saw that uptick in activity, um, we would have went out to the market looking for specific types of roles and started to realize that there wasn't really that many um, qualified people probably in the market as maybe as we expected. And it really forced us to kind of repivot the way we looked at it in terms of how do we grow our own capability and how do we plan more into the future and get ahead of some of the need, the kind of skills needs that uh, we're facing into. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of retention, we've probably seen a lot of new energy actors coming into the industry at the minute. So there's a lot of uh, need in other organizations in Northern Ireland here for the same skills that we have. And um, what we've seen there is probably some people within our organization who have been here for a while starting to move into different organizations. So retention has been a challenge, albeit we've been doing a lot of work in that space and we've got ourselves to quite a good place at the minute where our retention rates are quite high. Great, okay. Well, um, what are some of the cultural changes you've had to make to improve retention? So over the last number of years, NI Networks has invested heavily in uh, our organizational culture and a lot of our, a lot of it comes down to kind of leadership development and understanding. Right. Um, so some of the stuff, you know, particularly in a high risk industry like, ourself, like ourselves here, safety is paramount. And what we've been doing within the organization has primarily been focused on safety culture, albeit it's really getting to uh, the heart of it where our people really matter to us and you know if we're going to grow this organization we need everyone within the organization engaged in training and learning um, and we also need each other to be looking out for each other in terms of keeping everyone in the organization safe and it's even fed into the organization's decision making um, in terms of how we grow the organization sustainably and um, whenever you look at the amount of investment needed and um, you can quite quickly run away with yourself in terms of ambition in ter- you know, in terms of the speed that we, we have to do this at. But we've been working with, you know, our own kind of senior leadership teams and their contracting partners to make sure that we're doing this at the right pace and we're not going to be putting any anyone at any undue risk as we're doing it. And um, so culturally that kind of needs um, the organization bought into like people are the first and foremost kind of priority for us and investing in people is, is, is paramount in that case. Right. Okay. So when you're talking about culture change, really what I'm hearing is at the heart of it is safety. Um, Can you define the spectrum of activity that goes into that? When we talk about safety, what what are the parameters? So I think like safety traditionally for me, and I've been in the industry for 20 years, um, the the, the electricity industry has kind of very rigorous kind of rules and procedures, and Mm -hmm. they're necessary in terms of keeping um, people who are working in this industry safe. I think the next evolution for that as an industry is really understanding the kind of human element and the human factors. And, you know, despite all the rules and procedures that we end up, there's still incidents that can happen. Um, and whenever you 
want to take it to the next level. It actually takes a lot of deep engagement with the organization, a lot of uh, learning and listening with and you know the, the the kind of people who are touching the network to understand what are the barriers they're coming up against or how do they see the procedures working for them or against them. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been a big change in our organization to try and get everyone to speak up, everyone understand that they have a voice um, and that actually makes you a safer organization then. So what we're seeing would be far more reporting about a kind of an open, honest, kind of near miss uh, nature. And that allows the organization to become a learning organization. So we're getting ahead of things actually happening. Right. That has wider benefits then as well. So if you think about the innovation challenges that are facing the organization, that's the same type of culture that's needed to be creative. Right. And so, so we're, we're kind of getting the benefits, we're seeing the benefits of having uh, an organization where leaders are going kind to of be more vulnerable, engaging to understand how the front line see things and taking those forward as kind of solutions. Right. Okay. As time goes on, I think a lot of people are talking about cybersecurity being core to safety as well. How are you integrating safety and cybersecurity and how's that likely to evolve? So in my, in my sense, that it would be it's it's a very similar thing in terms of like cyber secure organization um, is one where everyone is aware and engaged in the importance of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, what we'll need, you know, just as we need people to speak up about whenever we, they see something that's potentially dangerous on site, we need people to speak up if they see something that's, uh, you know, of a malicious nature in terms of phishing emails or so on. Like that. So we, we've been doing a lot of work with educating our workforce around the risks of cybersecurity and um, giving them the tools to be able to report it effectively and encouraging them to understand that, you know, if they find something or they, re they report it, that they'll be supported in that. Well, a lot of utilities um, say that the human factors are the real barriers to good cyber hygiene and cybersecurity in general, um, motivating the workforce to take personal responsibility for cybersecurity in the workplace has been a challenge. Is that something that you've been able to crack? And if so, what's what's your secret? What's what's the code? <laughs> yeah, so I, I wouldn't say we're focused particularly around the human factors in cybersecurity, but the human factors in terms of safety are very similar, you know, in, in terms of people taking personal responsibility. So some of the kind of roadshows that we've organized internally, um, we've moved away from the idea that, you know, management are here to kind of tell you how to do things and mm -hmm. getting people to sit and actually sit back and think about what can they do within their roles to, to help. And I think that kind of mindset within the organization um, crosses across, cuts across a number of different issues that we're facing, such as cybersecurity. So having a workforce that um, don't, are, aren't passive, you know, aren't just doing things for the mm -hmm. sake of doing them, that understand why they're doing it, um, are engaged in thinking about the nature of their roles, and um, that is the type of organization that will actually um, you know, be resilient against some of the human factors that you might see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a, a, an empowered workforce that is part of creating the solutions is going to be a lot more compliant with those solutions, aren't they? Which creates cohesiveness in the organization. What are some of the um, initiatives that the workforce have come up with, some innovations that they've come up with around safety and security? So we, we have a structure in place where we've created local leadership teams. So right mm -hmm. across the country, given we're geographically dispersed, what we've done is within our kind of different depots, um, we've created a local leadership team, right. which is made up of a multi-disciplined group of uh, staff. And what they're there to do is to listen to their colleagues and to hear about what are the issues that are arising, but they're empowered then to you know, go and uh, fix whatever's broken, you know, and, and give that we give them the tools and the support needed mm -hmm. to kind of improve the overall kind of hygiene factors potentially, you know, around the organization. And we found tremendous kind of benefits of that, you know, when, whenever you see people taking action into their own hands, you know, and not just always um, feeling the need that they, they can't do anything about it. Yeah. But they, they, now have, they now have a voice, they now have a place where they can go to and resolve issues. And there's like I would attend those sessions. There's other senior leaders across the organization with that and it's a really fantastic opportunity to really understand where the pain points are in the organization and how do we eradicate them. Mm -hmm. That all plays into like a healthy culture in my mind that you know we're you know from top to bottom, we're all in touch with each other and we'll have the mechanisms and structure in place to be able to hear what's getting in the way. 
Right, right. You mentioned leadership as being key to the culture change that, that you've made, and obviously some of the examples you've given here about leaders really engaging the workforce. What else has changed in terms of leadership? What would you say in the last five years uh, has changed in terms of the types of leaders or the leadership norms that you're reinforcing within NIE? I think what we've done, we've invested happily with a lot of our leadership development programs. So we've brought in experts, you know, psychologists and culture oh. experts into the organization to yeah. kind of educate us around what good looks like. Um, and I suppose in terms of, you know, leadership styles, we've probably changed a bit from being a directive leadership mm -hmm. organization to be more, and more supportive. And that takes a lot of work in terms of the engagement needed. So like one of the things we would talk about would be listening tours. Mm -hmm. So senior leaders in the organization would go out with a number of questions to try and understand, you know, what's going on and actually do listening tours with different groups of staff, capture mm -hmm. all that data. And we bring that back and we can get a, once you put that all down the table, you can get a good sense of if there's any kind of underlying cultural themes and mm -hmm. um, a, a play and then we can take action off the back of that. And it doesn't always work, but at least we're stepping forward. We've, and if it doesn't work, then we can go back around the loop again and see what we, we need to do better. But that say overall, the senior leadership stance in, in the company has become a lot more vulnerable. You know, we're out there engaging a lot more and, and really seeking answers. We, we kind of see our people as, as the solution to a lot of the problems rather than senior leaders maybe feeling that they have to have the answers all the time. You're right. that's, that's really engaging, I think, for everyone in the organization and it's helping us kind of uh, step forward and deal with the challenges that we're faced with. Great. And have you been able to measure the impact of this culture change and leadership change? So, so we do um, we have a couple of things probably in terms of a barometer on this. So we measure our employee engagement scores. Uh -huh. So there's two elements in that. There's actually the, the percentage of people who engage with the survey itself, and that was at 82% the last time around, which is pretty high. Like if you if you asked an external party, you know how much how much response they get to these surveys, like 82% is a is pretty high indicator that people are engaged in its own right. Uh -huh. um, and then the score that came out off the back of it the last time was 88%. Um, so that's really like we're really proud of that, and that's taken a lot of work to get up to those kind of numbers. Um, externally, we've been accredited with investors and people platinum, mm -hmm. which is the highest level of accreditation. And again, like the, the amount of effort and uh, thought that's went into achieving that, that accreditation is significant. But that that all is reflective of the kind of the importance of this, that the you know importance that we as leaders in the organisation see in engaging the people in NA networks and giving them the tools to be able to deal with the, the work that's in front of them. Mm -hmm. Um, we also see it's probably more uh, tangential to this, but you can start to see things like like open near misreporting. All these like they're all we kind of green shoots of a, a more open culture in my mind, right. where people are coming forward saying I nearly did this or you know I, I did do I did kind of make a mistake, but they're not afraid of reporting it up because they, they know that they'll be supported. But that that's a great sign for me in terms of well when if we can't see the problems we can't fix them. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they're bringing them forward, it means we can do something with it. And we're, you know, the organization's making great progress in that regard. Great. Okay. Well, Ronan, my last question for you is, um, if I was a young engineer just about to graduate from university, considering a range of careers in a range of sectors, why would I choose NIE? How would you sell me that job? <laughs> So I, 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 haven't been, I haven't been in the industry for 20 years. I, I don't think there's a better time to join uh, the energy industry. There's just so much opportunity. Um, I look back whenever I started in the industry and kind of looked at all the engineering solutions were nearly there. You know, there, there wasn't massive investment. We were more in an operate and maintain kind of mode. Mm -hmm. um, I actually believe we're at a, at a point now where we're nearly back to first principles again in terms of like designing and developing solutions that have never been built before. Mm -hmm. So it, and you know it combines so many different elements of engineering. So like it's not just a, if you do an electrical engineering degree, it's not just about that. It's actually the, there's several. There's the uh, structural engineering. There's the mechanical engineering. There's so many elements that are going to have to come together as well as the digital solutions. Mm -hmm. So my, my sense is that you know if you come out of university at the minute and you have a degree that can get you into this industry 
there's just a plethora of opportunity, you know, and you can really take your career whatever way you want it to. Uh, to and you know, I think that's that's something that shouldn't. Um, that's something that you know younger people should really appreciate in terms of like there's not many other industries that can give you that at this stage. Right. The other, the other, so the, the other the other probably big thing for me actually would be it's the purpose that you know there's probably never been a time where the electricity industry or the energy industry has come into such a spotlight and and mm -hmm. um, you know the future of the planet in some ways uh, depends on how fast we can go and you know bringing all the kind of creativity and innovation into this industry will will be massive in terms of how we can transition to net zero so you know, if you want a career that has real meaningful purpose, there's probably nothing like it out there at the minute, um, like this industry. That's right. Yes, purpose. And I'd say in the last few years, it's become a lot more fast moving and dynamic as well. So a great place to start your career as an engineer. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and insights today, Ronan. Been really good speaking to you. And we're going to speak to you again about the shape of the future workforce. Look forward to that conversation. No problem. Thanks, Montana. Thank you, Ronan. Join us again next week as we unpack another big topic shaping the future of the power grid. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Smart Grid Forums, and follow us on LinkedIn. Until then, thanks for watching and listening. This is Powering the Future, a podcast series brought to you by Smart Grid Forums. One planet, one power grid.